Okay, this is the October 14th, 2020 um, audit committee meeting. Um, and I want to go ahead and run down a list. Stephanie, can you run down a list of um, all the folks who are chimed into the meeting right now? Okay, I see Manager Williams, Assistant mm -hmm. Manager Lennon, um, Commissioner Wright, Commissioner Link, Commissioner Thornton, um, guest um, Elizabeth Higgins, and guest Hune Kadir. Did I leave anybody out? Okay. okay. So we were missing Commissioner Davenport and Commissioner Edwards, but we do have a quorum with three of us here. Um, did anybody get a chance to look at the minutes? Does anybody want to make a motion to approve those minutes? So I'll, I'll second. I just now got them, and since I wasn't here, um, I'll just second them, knowing okay. that you guys have already okay. read them. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, Stephanie, do you want to... A quick update on the audits that are wrapping up the and animal services audit. Yes, yes. I mean, one quick question. Yes, so the fleet management program audit is um, well. The fleet management program audit is um, ninety-eight percent finalized, and I anticipate submitting that to the department by the end of this week. Um, the Animal Services Department audit, I received some additional information after the report was complete that I added into the report, and I anticipate both of those reports will be submitted to departments in the manager's office and to the committee by the end of this week. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of special guests here at this committee. Um, we've got some folks from the Overview Commission. The Overview Commission is um, a charter-mandated citizen commission that um, is charged with taking a close look at the charter every 20 years, and they've been working for almost a year now. I guess they've, it's been a challenging thanks to the pandemic, but um, they've taken a good look at the Office of Operational Analysis, and they wanted to share some information with us. Um, so I would, so Huneid or Elizabeth, um, which one of you is going to do the presentation? Uh, Elizabeth will do the presentation. If I can just make a couple of words of introduction, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself and then you may, maybe you can introduce Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, I'm Huneid Kadir. I live in district seven and have resided in Athens since 1992. Uh, with me and presenting our analysis is Beth Higgins, who resides in District 1 and has been since 2007. We are both members of the 2020 Overview Commission. Beth is also the chair of the Overview Commission. However, we are here tonight as citizen members who have served on the Overview Commission in the Audit Focus Group. We do not represent the other members of the Commission as this analysis was completed after the majority of the Overview Commission members voted to close the formal report in August and exclude additional input. Uh, this was, as we all know, due to pandemic, some attrition, and uh, difficulty for people to be able to continue the same way. Uh, the performance of the internal audit process remains of concern and we are appreciative of the opportunity that the audit committee is granting us to provide our input to the audit committee. Uh, there were there are just two key points that made us want to look into the audit process. Uh, during her presentation to the overview commission, the auditor had indicated frustrations regarding the process. And actually the main key was in three years, only three audits had been performed and I believe one of them was from an outside contractor. And uh, when looking at comparing this data with the data from earlier years, uh, that was of concern. Uh, just to get an understanding of how the process had worked in the past and to understand why and how the audit committee was formed, I did meet with three of our ex-mayors, uh, 
including uh, Mayor Looney, who, uh, under whose time the operate, uh, Office of Operational Analysis was formed, and, uh, uh, and also with uh, our ex-auditor, ex-commissioners who were involved when the audit committee was formed, and that helped us kind of get a un little understanding of how uh, we, where we are today. Most importantly, we received feedback from the current auditor, the manager, and also from uh, two members of the audit committee. Uh, so Beth Higgins will now present the findings and analysis, and at the end, I'll just conclude with a couple of words. Uh, as Beth. Uh, thank you. So I do, I do want to be careful on, on how what terms we actually use a little bit tonight. So I, I can't really, um, since we're not auditors, um, saying that we're having particularly findings is, is something just a step too far. So it is really our impressions. Um, and from feedback that we've had and things that we've seen um, in the process. So as Hunad mentioned, we had an um, audit focus group. Uh, we had changed the organization of the overview commission halfway through as a result of the pandemic. Um, but due to um, significant attrition of members because of the pandemic for personal reasons and other, um, we changed the format to focus on particular areas that we thought were important. and um, the. Um, the function of internal audit was something that we really wanted to look at, and um, but unfortunately, we lost more members, and the rest of the commission voted to complete the overview commission report um, information. So what you have tonight is from members of this focus group who wanted to communicate this to you, um, and you will not see it in the final OC report unless there is some change uh, in the commission members and their decision. Um, so just open up now, you're gonna to have to help me out here a little bit to share, um, I do have a PowerPoint um, presentation for you, which should take about 15 minutes. Um, and I think all I need to do is share, right, on the bottom of the screen to, to share my screen. Is that how that works? That's, that's correct, in the top left, you should see share. I have a bottom, let's see. Or at the bottom should be a circle. There we go, okay, got it. Is it up? Yes. It's good? Yes. All right, very good. So it's a new set of new set of challenges in technology here. <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to first go over the outline. As you can see, uh, we wanted to offer some of our general impressions and background information and then try to give you a couple of recommendations. I wanted to start with the concept of citizen expectations of compliance auditing. Um, this slide kind of begs the question of how much and how often are department and agencies inspected for compliance? And as you know, from the Office of Operational Analysis, the answer is not often. The, the exception, of course, to annual audits is the finance office, and that's required by state law, but that's not an internal auditing function. Um, that's conducted, conducted by an outside auditor, and it's not managed by the Office of Operational Analysis. We assume that many other departments and agencies complete some level of external evaluation for compliance within their fields from other levels of government. But um, as you know, this is neither managed or evaluated by the Office of Operational Analysis. The answer to the question of completed performance auditing is similar. There is little evidence that there is programmatic performance auditing completed at a rate that would be considered sufficient for the size and complexity of our local government. So we saw that there are a lot of reasons for this level of output, and actually some of these reasons may be quite serious, but I think most of them are solvable. The result is we can't benefit from a comprehensive audit environment without the expectation that departments and agencies are subject to regular and programmatic compliance or performance audits. athens Clark County satisfies um, the Finance Officer Association recommendation to have a formal internal audit function through its charter, as you know, and does follow best practices by governing the work through an appointed audit committee. However, the internal audit program does not seem to exhibit the expected characteristics of an effective system. 
From our view, an effective internal audit program should be integral to management's internal control system. It should directly address standard and unique risk. It should be programmatic, meaning we should expect to see a standard internal audit program which gives public assurance of required controls, transparency and evaluations, and which most importantly creates a disciplined and compliant agencies and department. I'm sorry, where did you get that definition? Sorry? Where, this is Commissioner Russell Edwards. Thank you for right. this. Uh, where, where, how did y'all come up with what you just read? That sounded so I do have very in official. The back, in the back of the, um, uh, the briefing at the end, um, I have all the references that I've used. Um, and this one was primarily from the Government Finance Officers Association. So there's a particular uh, professional industry association of finance officers, and that, that was pulled from their guidance. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Agencies, departments, and functions, which are not subject to regular audit, sometimes develop processes and procedures which may create more risk, may deviate from policy, and at worst may create opportunity for fraudulent behavior. We don't see evidence of a formal internal control system, one that's managed, um, a managed set of internal controls for each department that's kind of centrally controlled. And we actually see a reluctance to implement a comprehensive internal auditing program in, um, in athens Clark County. Uh, most of the audits that we've looked at, the ones that are completed, and of course, this is what the OC wanted to look at right away when we started our work was, you know, how many audits are there? It's kind of a baseline to look at where we are in operations. The ones we see appear mostly to be reactive or special request. The exception again, of course, is the annual financial audit. And I have to exclude that because that's an external audit required by law and completed by an outside auditor. So what are the characteristics of an effective internal audit system? So these three things um, is what we would like to identify as what we would think would be good to see. Um, first, the program should address critical areas of standard risk. Standard risk, you, you all know you're on the audit committee that's managing resources, personnel, and, and money. Unique risks are those that are specific to our jurisdiction or the impact of changing technology. For example, many local governments have faced threats of ransomware or cyber activism, which have not only created havoc in operations, but cost governments in the millions of dollars. Preparing and responding to this type of specific risk requires proactive approach to risk management. The second item is creating a programmatic system necessary if you want the benefits of creating an environment which results in high management standards. Being subject to regular independent evaluation creates an environment of accountability and transparency. And when I talked earlier, I mentioned about citizen expectation that's kind of coming from that direction. But the third item, the third bullet is the most important. The key to a great internal audit program is the third characteristic, supporting a comprehensive internal control system. These, the best programs work hand in glove with management to create, monitor, and improve and evaluate internal control system. So I just wanted to talk quickly. I don't want to go into good, a lot of great detail here because it can get very, very technical, very fast. Um, but there, and there are a lot of different, I'd say, um, approaches to what the internal audit standard is. First, talking about kind of industry in general, they have a wide array of audit programs. With government, they share the requirements for accounting standards and financial audits. For industry, internal audit focuses on financial audit and management accounting measures. For industry, these requirements are necessary for tax purposes and, of course, to provide transparency and accountability for shareholders. In the government, internal audit satisfies a very similar function, but the financial accountability and program effectiveness is assurance to taxpayers and citizens. And the item here that I put on this slide, this concept of governance of the internal audit standard. So are there, there are many different ways to do this. Um, and every size government and different level of governments have different approaches to this. Um, internal audit officers can work for directly for elected officials. They can be incorporated into a management structure. And they also can be appointed by outside agencies. I, I've seen a lot of different examples of all of these. The internal audit function can even be executed by contracted audit companies, similar to what we do for financial audits. But whatever the hierarchical structure is, internal auditors have to maintain their independence from influence. 
in order to create an effective program. So the gold standard is, not surprisingly, the yellow book. Um, and this is right from the GAO. And I didn't want to go again into great technical detail, but high quality government auditing is derived from this standard. The generally accepted government auditing standard is known, as you see here, as the yellow book. The goal of the yellow book is to provide a framework for conducting high quality audits with competence, integrity, objectivity, and independence. The next thing that actually should work very closely with internal auditing is internal control systems. So the GAO also has um, the standard for internal control, um, and this is called the Green Book. The infographic that you see on the right side kind of outlines in shortened form the federal approach to government internal control programs. But I wanted you to realize that both programs are very detailed, they're quite complex, and um, applied at every level, state and local governments, Aspects of these programs, or even in entirety, are, are, quite, are quite useful for local governments. Um, the state of Georgia provides detailed guidance on internal control programs. The state issues guidance, which is actually derived from the Green Book. Local programs and requirements are normally derived from state guidance, but in Georgia, um, they do not prescribe how local management should operate their internal control programs. So local governments have a lot of freedom and flexibility on how to do that. With exception of financial audit requirements and certain federal programs, of which now we are involved in at a lot of levels, certain federal programs above a certain threshold, there is a wide variance in how local governments approach this. Now, I added this slide. I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but it's something, it's a useful um, uh, list of the five components and some principles of internal control. And I think you're all going to recognize that these are very useful concepts to be able to apply to our program. This, um, this came right off that infographic, but it also is also directly out of the state standards. So um, you see how they try to identify how these uh, programs work together, how this approach works together in order to have really a con comprehensive approach to internal control. Um, this slide showed a nice list of um, regular action by audit committees of small local government. So I was very interested to see that. And there were a lot of things in there that um, you will see right away is not something that our audit committee does, um, primarily because I think this list was designed for very small local governments. Um, and I don't think ours um, would, would satisfy that requirement. But I did want you to identify the second one, that the organization's internal control policies are effective and being followed as an important and critical part of what a audit committee um, can accomplish. Um, I, I do need to mention that many small governments find it cost prohibitive to have an internal audit office. We are, in my mind, very lucky to have it as well as having an audit committee. This is the rec recommended structure in best practices. But the implementation of an internal audit program is hard and sometimes even harder the smaller the government is or the size of the government. Uh, many times I see many of the problems we have in athens Clark County. And, and personally, I think we have a terrific small government. We have a terrific town. And I'm very proud and happy of all of you who work so hard to keep it that way. Um, but we are a big, small, we're a big, small town or a small, big town. And this function, the internal audit function, is one of the examples of being in a big, small town, how hard it is to do this particular function. Because good internal um, controls and good internal audit um, is not cheap. So um, we are complex enough uh, to be able to require it, in my mind. We have um, a large enough um, budget. We have complex enough structure um, that we really do need it. Um, but we don't, may, may not have the resources to make it at the level that we would like to have it. Um, one of the, one of the um, messages out of this particular um, extraction was that um, the author felt that developing an internal audit committee may the, be the government's best, and in many cases, only way to determine that internal controls are functioning properly. Okay, so now can I back. can I'm I sorry. ask you something real quick? Yeah, please. Um, how much of what you're explaining regarding the benefits of internal audit controls? is accomplished through the annual 
state law required external audit. What's what's the crossover there that maybe y'all were able the, to the financial audit. so for the books so the GAFER and the and the annual financial report is what you're speaking about. Yes. So the evaluation, the audit of that. So indeed, that's required by state law. That's the most important um, basic level of financial compliance. And that audit, um, the requirement of that audit is to make sure that the financial statements that are presented are presented correctly and presented in accordance with government accounting standards. Gap. Um, and there's, it's very complex, like any kind of other financial statements. And government financial statements are no exception. Um, there are new rules every year on how you present your financial information. Um, but that is auditing. And we'll, we're, we'll, um, we'll cover that as I continue on, that particular question that you have, um, because, it, um, but it, because it's a very good question. Okay. Um, I wanted to, the question, this question about do we need an internal auditor office in Athens? So this, this question has been asked in the past and continues to be a valid question considering the level of audit output in the last few years. In our view, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Is the risk of not having an office at all or even maintaining an office restrained from completing a comprehensive program worth the savings of not having an established office? Indeed, with a couple of exceptions, we actually are doing pretty good. So you see the screenshot here of our Moody's credit analysis. That there in the right corner there is pulled off of, um, I bought one of those a couple of years ago when I was studying our finances. And it shows us um, A1, AA1, which is nearly the highest. It's the second highest rating a local government can achieve. So these ratings include specifically analysis of financial risk, particularly with regards to debt and financial position. Moody's view, athens Clark County is low risk for serious financial issues. Every year, our financial statements are awarded the highest level of recognition for completeness and accuracy. So the question is, is this because we're doing everything right? Have we implemented all the appropriate checks and balances? Does this mean that we have mastered our risk? So in order to answer that question, when you talk about potential risk, I wanted to talk about a case, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. I, I looked at, I tried to find um, a lot of representative local, um, uh, you know, towns our size and uh, almost organize the way we are to see some kind of issues and problems that they can get into and then kind of compare their internal controls, their um, internal audit and, and their financial documents to see how that represented their towns. So this particular case was quite interesting because it's a similar case. It's not exactly the same. They're not organized exactly the same as we are. Um, this is a case from county in North Carolina. So the picture at the bottom is Joe Wiseman. He was a contractor convicted in federal court last year for bribing a bump cone county officials in exchange for contracts. He is now serving 37 months in prison and owes the county over $900,000 in civil suit charges. The top picture is the former longtime county manager, Wanda Green, as she was ordered to pay $750,000 and report to federal prison. Her replacement, Mandy Stone, was also indicted in order to pay $171,000. And two other senior county officials are also serving federal sentences. So, so far you see an outside contractor uh, bribing uh, people at a lower level in the, in the county, um, then all the way at the top, somehow um, not managing internal controls and then directly involved in some kind of corruption. But finally, and not exempt from this, caught up in this, the center picture is former County Commissioner Ellen Frost. There's a commissioner who got caught up in the scandal um, with what I kind of looked at as a very well-meaning, um, so she's not going to go to jail, but she's still a very self-serving kind of business support deal that violated regulations. So that involved um, moving economic development funds to an airport authority, and uh, their structure is a little bit different from ours, but the economic development um, department covered both Asheville and Buncombe County, and the airport authority is a standalone separate authority. And um, if anybody wants to know the details of all that, it's a very interesting case. Her case is very interesting, but what it was is she got caught up in that because there was a whistleblower that um, notified some of the corruption that had been going on in the in the county for some time. And this was a county that had excellent financial reputation. Internally, they knew that there were some issues, and there always are some things going on in, in local government, but this one was particularly egregious. And um, when the federal government got involved, of course, um, uh, quite a few people went to jail over that. So um, after looking at that kind of sobering case, 
um, I'd like to review the important roles of the internal auditor. Each of these are critical to achieving high expectations of managing our public functions and our tax dollars. So first you see on the slide is compliance. And this was to, and to answer your question. There are several different levels of compliance, primarily financial co compliance, but these are reactive and after the fact. Um, the secondary one, the one that we're kind of focusing on today, is internal control programs and performance analysis. So this is more proactive. This is trying to be able to identify um, your risk ahead of time and to have appropriate controls on those risks and then evaluating that those controls stay current and those controls are monitored at an appropriate level. It doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have issues or problems of different kinds of, um, of corruption within the government. Um, you can have the best control system in the world and you can still have one bad apple. Um, but in general, you're looking for that reasonable assurance that you've identified these risks, especially in financial transactions, um, and you have controls in place that you can identify them and that you're checking them. And the third thing is, the third one um, is special analysis. So special analysis, we seem to do a lot of that here in, in Athens, where we have a problem or an issue and we end up doing an audit based on that problem or issue. It's still an important function of the internal auditor, but it's the third, and you know, I, I hate to put these necessarily in, in that kind of order, but um, uh, from, from my perspective, that's, that's the, the level uh, of priorities for the auditor's office. Uh, so I bring you this, uh, uh, this idea about most audit concerns revolving around financial compliance. So any of you that have read the annual financial statements every year, you know that there's some truth to this cartoon. Most financial documents are very detailed and very technical, and it does require sometimes an accountant or a CPA to explain them. But we do a very good job here every year on our financial statements, and we satisfy all statutory requirements as far as I can see and, um, and our audit requirements for our finances. But as to answer your question before, accounting and accountability um, is not necessarily the same thing. The primary job of internal auditing certainly is compliance, but there is much more to accountability beyond mere financial or procedural accounting. Uh, there is a true requirement to ensure that programs are not just efficient, but that they're accountable and they're effective. So again, I wanted to show you kind of what I thought is the hierarchy, and I don't know if you're gonna find this in the literature, this is kind of the way I, I see it after looking all of it is you've got this top line, which is your compliance, and this is what you want the internal auditor to make sure that we have systems in place to make sure that we have this level of compliance. Then this internal control program, which is essential to be able to support all these compliance programs. And then lately, uh, performance auditing is all the rage. It's very important and can be very supportive and effective to help management improve. Um, so not just efficiency, but actually program efficiency that, you know, that we're getting our monies out of each program, but the effectiveness that we're actually, the program is actually doing what we want it to do. This is very important for us, especially with all the kind of programs we have here in athens Harp County. Um, we have such a supportive government, such a um, supportive commission, and these programs that we put in place um, are, are terrific, but we need to be able to make sure that they're actually doing what we want them to do, especially after years when they're in place, um, that effectiveness uh, for achieving a level of policy um, uh, goals may may change. And then this idea of special analysis, as I say, we do that a lot. And then some area that we see that we don't really have at all um, is um, a whistleblower program. So we don't have a formal program that I can find. Um, I uh, uh, We may have some systems in place and some ways to be able to show for anything from an unhappy um, um, resident to somebody that actually finds fraud, waste, and abuse that the mechanisms to be able to um, to be able to answer that are not not very clear to me. Um, you'll recognize this um, um, that we pulled out from uh, from the newspaper from last year um, or the year before. So this is an example of um, responding to risk rather than being proactive on risk. So. As I mentioned to someone before, there are thousands of opportunities for potential risk, right? So that's why it's hard to do the risk analysis and make sure that you have an airtight way of never having a problem. Um, and then there's, you know, every crisis that you have, well, that's an actual crisis. So you do need to respond to it. You need to, you do need to analyze what went wrong and how to fix it. But the question is how much of this is preventable 
um, the reactive ones. Since we do mostly reactive auditing, um, it's hard to say. So the um, American Council on Fraud Examiners studies fraud prevention and fraud detection. And important takeaways from this slide is to show that um, a form of the formal whistleblower programs from their analysis, um, under 50% uh, of um, their uncovered scheme came from whistleblower programs, and 18% um, came from internal audit procedures. So that's 68% of schemes that they uncovered. Now, of course, you, know, you never know what schemes that they don't uncover, but it is important to remember that preventing fraud by supporting strong programs, I believe, is the best approach. Um, this is something that I don't know if you've been thinking about too much, but from the financial um, perspective, and again, this is the same uh, council from fraud examiners, uh, is what's happening with COVID. Now, I know that we're running a lot of COVID money through our government now, um, and a lot of programs are coming in the next couple of years. So this was astonishing to me when I saw this, that they made this report of what they're expecting to see. So already they saw a 77% increase in fraud from COVID and 92% of examiners expected an increase in fraud. And this slide shows you in particular what they've seen in payment fraud, unemployment fraud, and cyber fraud. So these are things that I know that will touch every level of government and particularly those that are unprotected by strong programs of preventing and, and, um, and actually detecting fraud. So finally, we come to um, some of our recommendations. So first, um, there is not a whole lot of, from our view, um, and, and I may be wrong here because I don't know very well all the backgrounds of everyone, but there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of technical capability on the audit committee. And the audit committee, I think, if I'm correct, is just made up of the auditor and five members of the commission. Um, I may be wrong there. Um, but it, it would be interesting to see if you had the capability of creating a structure in an audit committee. There are some towns that actually hire, not hire, they appoint um, a CPA type person or a fraud examiner type person or someone from the field um, to, to run audit committees because they know they can run through all the technical aspects of how to really establish and maintain good programs, hopefully in a, um, in a cost effective way. Um, but it is important to establish a baseline for governance of this accountability function. So in order to be accountable for our accountability function, the governance of internal audit is really important. There's a lot of towns where the internal auditor actually works for the manager, um, and that works very well um, in programs where um, the management integrates their internal control programs very carefully with audit. But of course, it's really important, as we mentioned before, that even under that kind of governance, um, the um, the auditor has to maintain a level of independence, um, just like if they operate under the audit committee or some in some towns they work directly for their mayors, um, and sometimes they work for chairs of the. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but um, in order to really have a good comprehensive program, you have to have really good governance. So who's in charge of kicking out um, the standards and making sure those standards are hit in terms of performance. So that brings us to the next one, which is to set a performance standard for the Office of Operational Analysis. So if you set that performance standard, which is something that I think um, the citizens, at least from the perspective of the Overview Commission, would really like to see, um, because on the surface, again, from those initial questions, initial slides, um, there's not a whole lot of productivity out of the, um, the Office of Operational Analysis for seeing things that if you wanted to go to the website and see where what, what are audits we've done, what have finished, what were the results, what was the follow-up. And it, it's just not, it's not a comprehensive program from the view of people that can see from the, the transparency perspective what's actually been done. There's probably thousands and thousands of other things that are being done, but that's not something that, the, that, um, that we're going to be able to see. What we see is what, what is produced. But in order to set a high performance standard, in order to execute a good internal audit strategy, you have to support, protect, and resource an office to do that because it's not cheap and it's not easy. If you ever want to take a look at that yellow book and see what it takes to do a good audit, whether it's a compliance audit or a performance audit, it's incredibly hard, very detailed. And that's why I didn't even want to use the word findings because there's a specific requirement for using that word findings when you do a technical audit. Um, so, um, 
in order to achieve that level of standard, of course, you're going to have to resource it. And the third item here, incentivize cooperation between management and the internal audit function. So um, I think that being able to um, achieve and maintain qualifications in local government fraud analysis and internal control programs is a great way either at the level of the assistant manager or even at the level of department managers um, that you've got people in management who are actively engaged in understanding how to do the internal audit function, how that works, and being able to keep a very, very high management control function in the government. And um, if they're engaged and they're um, involved in that, then, you know, then you've got, you know, quite, because of the way we're organized, because we have our internal audit function is separate from management here. And um, so in order to incentivize that cooperation, this is just one way of doing that. But it, it, I think that's maybe something that the audit committee can do is figure out a way to make that, um, that relationship more functional. Um, and lastly, this is of some practical steps. Um, set an environment of ongoing internal audit. For example, 20% departments program per year. Um, and I know you're all going to go, oh, my God, how are we going to do that? We can't, we can't get 1% a year. So we've got, we've got um, departments and agencies here that have not had internal audit, I think, ever. And um, that's astonishing to me. So when I worked over in the airport board and I said, you know, as a board member, I wanted to see their annual audit. So well, they don't have one. But how could you not have an annual audit at your airport? And they said, well, we have, we're incorporated into the finance audit. I said, well, that's a financial audit. <laughs> that's not an audit of all your procedures, all the, all the issues and problems you can have. All the transaction points you have with a very, very small staff just raises red flags that you don't have internal controls that are written every year to make sure those controls are in place. And um, I think, like I said, we have a terrific local government. So we have people that are responsible and they are, um, they are um, actively making sure their areas are really in, in, in tight shape for, from my perspective, from my experience. But the risk that you have there of one person that's not in that category, um, and then you have in a very small department, if you have access to um, money transfers and things that are not audited or not even expected to be audited, is a huge risk. Um, so the other two things I do understand as of late, um, the automation of the internal audit program. So um, I do understand that we're, we've made some progress on that. So that's just one way, of course, to, um, it's just tons and tons of work to be able to, to set up and execute audit at the level that we should be doing. But a lot of that can be automated. And um, if we have good software programs, that really helps. But to add on to that, we can do that with the internal control program. So I think the management should look at um, the state of Georgia has a very good internal um, uh, control program that's automated. Um, and um, it'd be, it, it really might be a good chance to see if we can um, uh, piggyback off of their program if they offer that for local governments. I don't know if they do. Um, because most of these programs aren't cheap. Um, so if we can get it from another government agency, um, because these internal control programs are pretty, they're pretty straightforward, right? That you identify where all these potential problems would be, and then you establish your controls, and you should do that every year. Um, so um, having that automated again would be really useful, especially for overview commissions when they come to look at the operations of our government, which is so complex, it's completely overwhelming when you don't have a baseline anywhere even to start. Um, and the last thing that we have here is to hire external assistants to catch up on overdue audits or develop department level audit systems. So this is another mechanism, and you may have it, we just don't find evidence of it, um, that each department has their own internal department level audit system. So at least at the level of department heads that they have an annual internal audit system. Um, and that's a little bit cheaper. Um, it's not as comprehensive and it's not um, necessarily um, uh, you know, at the level that you'd like to have. But if resources are a problem, then um, developing internal audit at the department level is truly the answer for smaller governments. All right. I hope, um, I hope that I didn't overwhelm you all with too much information I can pull out here. Questions? Let's see. We do have... Um, I think Hunad's going to pass this on to you, so you'll be able to click on a lot of this information if you want to go and get firsthand. There's so much out there, um, local government fraud analysis, local government internal control programs, state government stuff. There are so many resources out there if you want to know more technical information. Um, uh, but these are, these are primary, some of the things that I used um, to, to help support some of the comments that I made.
I've, I've got a couple questions or comments. Um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of an audit committee that includes um, appointed members with some technical expertise in, in these things. Um, you know, I don't think anybody on this committee actually has a professional background in the kind of finances or analytical things that, um, you know, an operation, a office of operational analysis addresses. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, if our, our, you know, this, this office is set up through the charter and, and would such a change mean a charter, you know, a big charter rewrite that would need state level approval. Um, I'd really be interested in, in, having this committee, you know, go through this, the concepts that were brought up in this um, report and discuss, you know, next steps and recommended changes to um, either the committee format or, you know, the, the structure of the office itself. Um, does anybody else have any comments about that? Uh, are you, are you, Calling names. Can you hear me? This is yeah, Alice. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, no, this, M Melissa, I'm so glad. We've got so much going on. And I'm, but okay, I'm, so glad, you can hear me. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, so glad you got this overview uh, brought to the committee because it does have a lot of things that it re references. Um, it's good feedback. It's good fresh eyes on, on a lot of the stuff. Um, I think that it's worth us keeping on our agenda, Melissa. I don't think we can wrap it up today, but I do think it's worth having on our agenda to continue discussions about it. Um, I, I, I would need time with that PowerPoint uh, and the references to, to sort of digest a lot of that. Um, in particular, the one uh, practical steps that says hire external assistance. We did that for the leisure services audit. We had a person that, you know, a company that was specialized in leisure services so that the, the, it, the comparison of best practices was, uh, you know, at the, at the forefront of what they knew. And, and so that helped. Um, and they teamed up with uh, Stephanie and her staff um, for that. So that might help. Um, um, so I like that example. We've done that once in my time since uh, 2013. Um, May I respond yeah. to uh, Commissioner Link's uh, comment about an external uh, committee and how that started? And actually, that was going to be one of the things I wanted to say at the end. Um, as I understood, Asheville was, uh, and along with Greenville, were two of our aspiration cities in terms of how they function. So I spent a little bit of time inquiring at the structure of Asheville. Now, they do have a different infrastructure. The auditor reports to the manager, and they come up with an audit plan, which is based on where the biggest risks are. Uh, the auditor does not have a collaborative relationship with the manager, but has a supportive relationship. But the key there is that the auditor has put together an audit committee of four members from the community. Uh, they are CPAs, chief financial officers, and people in the financial field to help her stay focused and not go outside her scope of the audit. Uh, and the chair of the committee is the deputy mayor, so that gives them that uh, uh, that link to the uh, to the legislative body. And actually, when I mentioned to her that we have five elected bodies on the audit committee, her reply, and if I may quote her, was oh, what a nightmare that would be. So <laughs> how do they ever get anything done? And uh, I think that's a very functional way to possibly look for you all to, uh, you know, look into the possibility of uh, restructuring. Uh, and one of the last comment on that is uh, the, the city council at, in Nashville and the mayor, they never get involved with the audit process. As I understand, Every time something goes through the audit committee here, it has to go to the mayor and commission. Somebody doesn't like it, it goes back and forth. So it's not the, the productivity of the Office of Operational Analysis is actually directly reflects the, the productivity of the audit committee. And I think maybe the mayor and commission should discuss within themselves whether they need to participate such extensively 
in determining as the audit process and not a political battle because as you know past audit committee chairs have shown little interest members are disengaged at times and it's understandable they don't have they're you know they're going from what other people tell them and not looking at the uh, uh, financial information the audit committee members change every two years by the time they get it uh, most of them end up leaving and uh, is it possible to take the political element out of the audit process I, uh, to piggyback on that, Hank, thank you for, for capturing that. Does that also, from what you learned, feed the reactive part of, you know, that we're talking about being proactive versus reactive? And did, did that fit into that as well? Uh, Beth, uh, well, I mean, the reactive part is you're always going to have an auditor there. You're always going to have an office. And if something comes up like the animal shelter, then, of course, you have to, if you don't have extra resources, you just have to stop other things and address that as quickly as possible. And that would, and that is always going to be there. Something will come up to someone's mind. A whistleblower may come up and uh, bring up something to your attention. And you should, the thing is that there is always going to be a political component in the sense that the, our elected officials need to respond to public issues or public outrage about anything in particular. So the auditor is a tool for that. But the primary function of the auditor, of course, is to set an audit environment so that all the departments and agencies know that they are subject to audit and subject to evaluation on a regular basis. So it does, you know, studies have really shown that if you have that kind of baseline in that kind of environment, and even if you don't get an audit, you, perf you perform better because you know somebody's going to be, might be checking the things. And, and so that's why internal audit is such an important function. And that's why there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, but you need to do it. You need to have a comprehensive program that's in place that you know that you're going to be checked. And it does, as I said before, it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have issues or problems or mistakes even. Sometimes it's mistakes and not intentional. Um, but there are, you know, serious potential for corruption problems in any government that has the number of moving parts that we do. And um, and you can't control everything, but you can make your program programmatic so that you can make a baseline there um, so that it's something that's reliable that all the department's agencies know that they're going to be subject to. And, and then if you need outside assistance, if you find bigger problems or other issues that are outside our own capability to manage, that's when you can look for outside help to do that. Um, and there is a lot of help out there and, um, there's a lot of uh, all kinds of fields to be able to help, uh, small governments do that, especially even from the state. So the state audit office has a lot of, um, technical capability to assist local governments, but you got to know what they have and you got to ask for it. Um, so as I say, I don't even know if you can get an internal control software from the state. They seem to have a good, um, a, a good piece and that would save us a lot of money and it would set again, a good baseline for knowing, identifying those points of risk that we have across our government. See, we cannot, uh, we are not in a position to judge personnel based on our what we did, but we can, this is why we are commenting on the process. And we just feel that with an internal control system is, you, you can rely on it a whole lot better than the manager, the auditor, the auditor committee, because people will come and go and might want a system which is a little more consistent with data. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's been my biggest frustration is, you know, um, as commissioners, we've got so many things on our plates and so yeah. many balls in the air, and we might show up to a, a meeting and, you know, have something on our plate, but we're highly distracted by something else and, you know, end up having to delay it a, a month or two months. I mean, I feel like that is what really contributes to the kind of workflow stoppage is the fact that this committee has to vote on every on audits, you know, on several steps along the way. And often that gets delayed. Um, and also the, the, you know, we, the office has had some staffing problems and, you know, the auditor doesn't have direct control over that staffing. It, it goes through HR. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that we, we could discuss, you know, as a committee, um, you know, just the, about the the function and the structure of the office and the process, um, you know, and, and I would love to see citizens come in on that discussion, citizens that have more expertise in the area. 
Um, you know, well, let's say, uh, you, know, you know, just coming up with a good multi-year plan that, that identifies the risk and you've got a five-year plan for audit and you set the numbers of what you think will be reasonable and what you might be able to afford based on resources mm-hmm. with internal and external audit. And you set that five-year plan and it's a standard, uh, you know, procedural policy and financial compliance and internal control compliance audits. And the scope can be modified if during that time or in between that that particular agency department has issues or problems. But in general, the scope should be pretty much the same for the basic audit. Yeah. You know, yeah. Even, you know, and the technical thing, you know, having somebody with technical expertise, that, you know, even with our financial compliance and we do such a great job there, we do have one really kind of important red flag in our financial compliance. And I'm really surprised um, that nobody's ever really noticed that. So um, we have a very good, like I say, we, we set out our financial documents very well. Our CAFERS are award-winning. Um, you know, since University of Georgia is here, everybody in the business department loves to study it, and and the and the public policy they love to study um, our work here in Athens because it's close by and it's easy and it does a good job. Um, but but one of the things we have is that we have the same auditor, I think now for I don't know, Blaine, check me if I'm wrong. Ten years that we've had the same auditor do our financial statements and. There's a great thing about that is um, that you have a, a company that you're used to working with. You know, it's cheaper to do contracts with the same company year after year. Um, they know our work. They know what we're doing. And, and so it's just easier and maybe even better. But on the flip side, um, the one of the red flags for financial compliance reporting is that you don't, in industry, you never keep an auditor for more than four, maximum six years. Because the problem is that you develop relationships, personal relationships between the company that's doing the auditing and the people that are getting audited. And if you have the same company, they kind of look at it the same way. So even though it's very complex and there's a lot of things they know they have to do, they kind of, they do all have um, kind of a, a program that they, the way they work through their financial analysis. And if you have the same company each year, if they miss something, um, they'll miss the same thing every year, year after year. And again, developing personal relationships between the people that you're auditing and the auditors um, is something that's really kind of frowned upon after about six six years. Yeah. The in government um, financial analysis, there's so few really good companies. And um, in Georgia, sometimes we're a little bit incestuous because we do our own stuff, right? We do it, um, you know, over and over and internally. So um, there are also other auditors that are available, nationwide level auditors. And I do think based on the amount of fin- um, federal money that we're going to get under COVID and then even some of the grants, I know we have some very large grants, that the single audit requirement, um, which is a complex requirement based on a financial funds threshold, um, that we might be hitting that this year. So we have to make sure that we get a company that's we're not getting any more sufficient. It was announced today. The governor is not allocating any more funding to local governments. It's all going to go into the unemployment state unemployment fund. So if we have anything over $750,000, which I think we did, yeah, we hit the single audit threshold for federal funds, depending on how that grant is designed. So, and that, and, and that, um, um, the airport grant that we have may may fall under that too, because I think seven hundred fifty thousand is the crossover for single audit requirements, and that's a relatively recent requirement, and it's um it's a little bit complex, but we I'm sure we have a lot of financial analysis requirements that we have for all our federal grant money, and I, I didn't look at that, but anyway, that was just one red flag that I saw, probably not an issue at all, but just something to think about when you contract for auditor external auditors, um, especially financial ones, um, that you change it up every five or six years. Well, does anybody have anything else to add? Um, Y'all are going to send us this presentation with your your notes and stuff, um, because I'd like to spend some time with it. You bet. I will email it to you, and, you know, we are just delighted to meet with any one of you afterwards, because I know the meetings are very short, and talk about some of the data where we or how we came up with our analysis and whatever, and I'm looking forward to that if anyone ever would like to. Thank you. Yes. I would like to take this chance and thank all of you for your hard work. I know how hard it is to do this, especially under COVID. Things have been really rough and you guys are doing a fantastic job. You keep, keep working hard, 
keep doing your best and keep up the faith because it's we, we're in for another six months of kind of tough stuff. And um, and I just want to let you know that I really appreciate all the work and time that you put into um, helping us have a good community here. Thank you. We really appreciate y'all's hard work. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, my only question, and, and it's, you know, uh, you know, you know, my frustration with uh, reports and search and, and, and information get, where does this take us next to? Well, I mean, they- I heard that uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Wright said she wanted to be more at this. The worst thing that we can do is not have a follow-up plan for the work that was put in into this, yeah, whatever I, that looks like. So I want to definitely put this on the agenda for next month. And, and hopefully by then, you know, we will have all, you know, gotten the report in the email and, and spent some time with it. And maybe we can um, come to next month's meeting um, ready to discuss it and, and maybe come up with some recommendations to bring forward to the commission. I mean, I have a feeling it would be several meetings worth of discussion, but um, I, I am fully committed to following up on this and, and, you know, seeing, bringing about some, some changes that will help things flow more smoothly. Um, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to see something like this just sit on the shelf. Like I'm ready to put it on the agenda and keep it there till we see some resolution. Um, Does anybody have any objections to that? Okay. I think that's it. Do we want to? Do do we need to put that into a vote so it's in the minutes that we continue to talk, discuss? I make a motion that we continue to discuss the information that was provided from two citizens in the overview commission. Is that appropriate? Yeah, I I think that's appropriate. I mean, um, Uh, I'll say. Okay, I'll say. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Well, Hunaid and and Beth, we really appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I think it's great to live in a town, which I think is fantastic place to live and manage. And I think we can maybe a little better. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. We've got an old business item on the agenda and, um, I wanted to return briefly to the work plan item that we voted on last month. Um, we've gotten a little bit of clarification on, um, some of the, you know, we talked about, let me pull up that agenda item too, so I can read it. Um, we want to talk about narrowing the scope of the ACCP, um, audit. Um, because apparently there are some ongoing analyses of that department, so we don't want to duplicate the work. Um, so let me, I, did y'all see the, the email from the mayor that kind of explained some of the work that's, that's ongoing and is going to be presented to the um, Justice Committee, Safety and Justice Task Force? Well, I, I did see that, Melissa, and I was um, one of the reasons I was not uh, in favor of us adding the police department as a work plan was um, because of the citizen committee that is going to be underway and doing the, an in-depth process with that. And is that the committee he's he is that the new name for that committee? That there was are in that email committees. You might be safety and safety and justice. And yeah, you might be confusing them with the Police Accountability Board. That committee's there's been a task force that's been setting right. up a structure for a police accountability board, and it's a citizen committee that would primarily be focused on um, kind of policy, p- police policy stuff. And Blaine, maybe you can chime in here and, and be more detailed about the function of that committee, the task force, and the committee that they're recommending. Um, well, wanna- I can I can chime in and say, you know, the mayor basically wants our committee to direct the auditor to look at the financial parameters of the police, where uh, funds are coming from the feds, where they're coming to the state, 
where they're going out. Yeah, and that's what we, can somebody, can y'all know I'm, there's some background noise going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was the primary intention of a, a police department audit was to look at funding and structure of the department, you know, because the funding for our department comes from all over, you know, all over the place. We have state grants, we've got federal grants, um, you know, plus yeah. we have internal funding. Yeah, that was the focus. And, and there was some mention of salary range, but there is an uh, ongoing um, analysis of that. Um, Blaine, do you want to quickly just talk about the two different committees? I, I want to get that straight in everybody's head. <laughs> what their functions are. Well, there's, there's, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. One is the Police Accountability Oversight Task Force, and the purpose of that committee is to uh, help make a recommendation to the mayor and commission about the structure of the actual entity that would work in hand with the police department uh, made up of a citizens group, ostensibly. They're working on that now. They've been working, uh, they were appointed back in February. Uh, we've had the National Association of Civilian Law Enforcement Oversight also in there helping as well. Um, the mayor had given them a number of questions to ask. That was their charge. Uh, they've gone a little further. Um, and, the, and the attorney's office is involved, and they're um, looking at different um, models. And uh, today, like for instance, we looked at some of the video from the incident a couple of weeks ago to talk about how the committee might, you know, look at use of force incidents and make recommendations on policies. So, mm -hmm. um, so they're doing their work, and I, I expect that they're going to culminate that hopefully in the next. Uh, they've been meeting every week here of late, uh, so that's coming. And then. Um, the public safety and justice uh, idea that I think uh, you all had given direction to, I don't think the CDO was a actually officially adopted, but, uh, you know, going with that bigger committee of institutional stakeholders and, and citizens to talk about how to improve the criminal justice system and improve outcomes in the community. Um, the mayor, I believe, has been uh, talking to folks, and that might be the reason why he uh, ask that we we hold off on um, getting too detailed until and and Commissioner Link we talked too um, that you wanted the committee to really help come up with some of the things that they needed to look at instead of giving a really um, you know structured charge. I think the mayor does intend to give them a charge. You'll have to ask him about that. But those are the two committees I think you're referring to. Is that right? Yeah, that is. And I think there's been some you know with the ongoing committee that's dealing primarily with policy, use of force kind of things, police oversight, um, you know, community interaction with the police. We're talking about the actual structure of the department itself and funding sources. Um, the, the kind of information that we can present to that justice and um, safety task force um, so they can have a better understanding of, of how the department is funded. Um, you know, some of these grant fundings have, have a lot of strings attached, but, you know, real narrow focus on what the funds are going to be used for. Um, so maybe what we need to do in, in talking about the scope of this, um, and from what I understand, according to the mayor, um, there is an ongoing um, salary analysis, um, correct, Blaine? For the, the department, that's yes, I, I can briefly explain it if you like. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, in the wake of the pay and classification update for the first time in, I think, 26 years, um, the mayor, you know, y'all approved some funding uh, to uh, implement those recommendations. And one of those was to create a separate public safety plan from our general employees plan. And the chiefs uh, came forth, and and like we've said, you know, you should be doing pay and classification studies every five years or so to make sure that you keep your internal equity and external equity on par. Uh, and we knew we tried to get close. We knew it wasn't going to be perfect. Uh, you also know that we have issues with uh, recruitment and retention uh, in all of our public safety. Uh, I think that was part of the audit that uh, Auditor Maddox finished on the sheriff's office. You know, it's in the police department for sure. Uh, and so uh, the chiefs all got together uh, and, and, you know, 
came to us last year about this time and said, look, we think that there are, are structures that could be um, um, more helpful at recruiting and retaining. And so uh, we took a quick look at that. We didn't have the answer in time for the budget this year, but you did approve $2 million for an ultimate solution. And so we have hired a consultant. They're working with um, HR and all of our chiefs are engaged. I've been in contact with our police and fire employees to update them on where we are. Part of that is uh, updating the external market analysis, you know, with peer communities and what the ranks, uh, you know, the various ranks make, uh, because the, uh, the, the market comparison from the MAG study is already two three years old. And so they're updating that. They're also going to come back with some alternatives on what's called a, a, a step and grade plan. And so it's sort of a, a predictable uh, progression through their pay scale and ranks. Uh, and that can be structured in a number of ways. Uh, but in that way, it would be a lot more transparent to officers. You know, if I stay here, I should be here within so many years, resources notwithstanding. And then if I, uh, for folks that are coming in, we have an easier way to plug them in as well. And so all that, uh, we hope to have this uh, analysis completed by in the next, within the next 75 days, uh, and hopefully implement something uh, in the new year uh, for our public safety agents. Okay. So um, looking at the, um, oh, wait, I'm looking at the minutes. I need to be looking at the agenda document. Sorry. Um, we need, we want to uh, fine tune that audit description. Um, and let me call it up. Commissioner, uh, I have a really quick question while yeah, you're pulling that up. Manager Williams. You, the final report for that, um, the consultant report, it will be ready in 75 days, approximately. Yeah, I, I said 75 days. I should have just said by year's end. Um, yeah, okay. We hope to get it by year's end. Thank you. Okay. Um. So, yeah, we want to go ahead and um, fine tune the uh, audit scope for for the police department. Um, and, um, you know, we're talking about an overview of the department's organizational structure. So there's a, you know, a clear presentation of the different units within the department um, and what kind of resources we need them. And then the breakdown of the different funding streams, um, the kind of information we can present to that committee. And I, I, I think we should, um, I think we should, uh, at, you know, add a bullet point um, for the auditor to meet with that committee. The committee hasn't even been appointed yet um, to get some feedback from that committee regarding the kind of information that they would like to to move forward with their, their work. Um, so, you know, if we can have the option to broaden the scope of the audit, you know, once that committee is up and running to, um, you know, have a, have a mechanism for, for seeking that information and an independent mechanism for seeking that information that they might request. Um, does anybody have any input on, on that idea? Allison? Yeah, I was, that kind of piggybacks back to what we were just talking about that we'll be having on the next meeting. You know what I mean? That uh, Let me, generically, if there's already a group that is associated with an area that's being audited, that that citizen group would be incorporated. You, you see what I mean? It's kind of a little bit about what we were thinking about from what we just learned from the overview yeah. well, stuff. Well, we learned from so, the overview commission app applied strictly to the audit process and the audit committee itself. Yeah. We're talking here about a, a task force that, you know, yeah. we committed to right. in the FY21 budget that strictly is looking at the policing and the interface with, you know, community building, mental health. Um, right. Well, I, I guess. A complex discussion yeah. we had. <laughs> well, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that we can keep discussing a process of how to um, get the extra, 
get more input rather than it just being us. Thank you. But anyway, like I, I, I mean, according to what we we voted on in our budget, it, you know, we are committed to establishing this citizen committee that will, um, you know, in, be part of this comprehensive, transparent, holistic, and democratic process for analyzing the structure and the function of um, public safety and policing in our community, um, and you know, proposing changes and and how how public safety interfaces with social services, um, mental health, those kind of things. Um, right. right. Well, I, I'm not trying to contradict you. I, I, I was just trying to piggyback that it's working well with what we already just learned about. And um, that by the time that happens, if we wanted to change the scope, but I think from what feedback I'm hearing that if we did just those two bullets, that that would be an appropriate scope. The first two bullets on... This is that chart that that's the chart got the that's attached to the agenda. I, I yeah yeah. If, um, if we did this, just the top two bullets, wouldn't that that would cover it, wouldn't it? From what y'all talked about, I would like to keep it open to give the auditor direction to meet with that committee. When it's formed, so she can bring any information back to us regarding you know information that that they are interested in. So so we have. You know, we have the knowledge that direct link to them, so we we have you know the the direction to expand the focus, expand the scope, because that happens all the time. You know, audits underway, the scope gets expanded. Um, so I, I, I'm I'm in favor of adding a third bullet point that that explicitly <laughs> interface with that committee. Well, Commissioner Lincoln, if I might, which committee are you talking about? The police oversight group or the broader committee of all the stakeholders? I'm talking about the committee that is not given um, public, public safety and justice task force. Now, that's, that includes a lot more than the police department. I just want yeah, to go. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Does anybody have any objections to that? Um, make a motion that we include those first two bullet points. Somebody, I barely can hear you, Rita. You're you're going in and out, girl. Oh, I think. Okay. I was. Yeah, it is. Go I'm gonna come off. I'm gonna come. Wait, I'm gonna wait. Is that better? That's better. Is yeah. That better? Um. Um. Help me out. I saw that. What I, as we were gathering this information, that it was going to um, be shared. I'm, I'm, it's just too many committees now. I'm just we're just committed out. I don't know who is who no more. So the point was a part of the point. We were going to share this information with uh, that task force um, that was going to be something they'll use as a tool. And now it sounds like we are also are we also asking information back from them as a tool. Is is that I mean or for our information? Yeah. I yeah like our, I mean, our, what I'm what I'm saying is, you know, first of all, this committee doesn't even exist yet. But you know, in order for them to get started, they'll need some information. So you know we're given our auditor direction to begin gathering that information, but also there might be additional information that they need or want. And, um, you know, I just want to give the auditor the, the go ahead. So we don't end up, you know, dragging this out through several meetings, voting on it over, you know, voting on it or needing more information or give her that open ended ability to that direction, to meet with that committee, to seek, to, to get the feedback from them so we have the the direction to expand the scope of this audit um, upon request from that committee. So the first part, then I am correct. We, you know, I am correct. The first part for, um, is uh, information that we, the auditor, gathers. It would be shared with this uh, committee when it's when it's formulated. Yes, and. Then and then the second part that you want to add to it, 
is to give her permission now to meet with the committee at such time that may that may mean um, that may mean it could mean widening the scope. Yes. Is that what you're asking? Exactly. For? We're basically given given her direction to meet with the committee um, to, to open the door. And when it is organized and 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 everything, right? Yes. Yeah. Once the committee's organized and they got everything set and they have an idea of what they're doing and um and maybe even after the the auditors already presented them with the information that we're directing, you know, she can get feedback from them that we can then give the authority to widen the scope. Does that make sense? I'll make it I'll also move that. Okay. Stephanie, do you got all that? I have plenty of... <laughs> I'll restate it. Well, it's, does anybody have a second for that? I, I still need some clarification because I thought that the feedback that we got was that we were trying not to duplicate what other entities were doing. And we're not duplicating it. Okay. No, we're we're not we're not duplicating the the pay scale thing. Um, we're simply. No, I mean, this sounds like a third item that we need clarification on. It not because if because if the charge for this other committee is already set, I'm unclear of how uh, uh, we're adding to. We're not that. duplicating anything. We're just giving the no. auditor the the go ahead to meet with that committee to get feedback. And then we can widen the scope. It's just given the auditor the, the ability to bring information back to us from that committee that we can then process. Okay, let me say this. You said to bring back feedback. Now, now, <laughs> Commissioner Wright got me confused. Okay, here we go. Uh, to bring back feedback. If there is no feedback, then the scope doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Yeah, I mean, if, if that committee doesn't want to want their auditor to do anything else if there's nothing that to say to us then that's the end of it but who knows they might have yeah. another request and i want to leave that yeah, door open for that citizen committee to get the information that they need yeah and that's what i'm saying i don't think we're committing to nothing new we're just in advance asking or giving direction to stephanie to, have, to meet with them as they normally would, as she would normally do. Yeah, and to leave the door open for a request for more or, info. Is, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want to second that? I I still don't I still don't agree with that added part, Melissa. I'm 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 working really hard to be supportive of the first two bullets, and now you're adding a third one that's really. Um, because if you look at the flow charts and stuff that we've worked on and, and I don't I'm not seeing I mean when they work, you know, the whole beginning of it, Stephanie, you might be able to help me out when you start an audit and you have to have that uh, beginning uh, scope meeting with the department. It at this point, we don't have it, including citizen groups. And I'm just um, unsure of how that would happen. It's supposed to work with the department. She, she met with okay. citizen groups in the animal control audit and, and in the leisure services audit. There were all kinds of citizen groups that got consulted in that. I oh, just, okay. I see how I see I see what you're saying. Yeah. But do we even have a name for this committee to have it in our bullet point? It's the uh, the overview and justice committee, the task force. No, I thought, see, now you've got me confused. I thought it was the citizens <laughs> oversight of the police department. No, you're thinking of the other committee. We're not even talking about that committee. Well, but, but the pro okay. 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 The okay. department, the, the, the department, the department for the audit that we're talking about is the police department, Athens Clark County police department. So we're about to have a citizens group that a task force is going to tell us what that citizens committee looks like. And that citizens committee is applicable to. Um, Blaine, to do you want to repeat the, the explanation about the two, the two no. separate committees? Well, actually it's three separate committees because one of them is a task force. that's going to set up the 
the one committee. Do you want to go through that again so Allison can understand no, it? No, no, no. Listen, sis, sis, I don't need that. I need I need to, to get more concise with it. We have a task force that's defining a citizens committee for citizens oversight and this, within the police department. What we're talking that's, about. I know, and I'm saying that's the group that I think is relevant to the audit. I don't think that the public safety and justice uh, larger group that Blaine said was had incorporated more than the police department is the right group. I think so. That's that's where that's where we have a difference of opinion. Okay, on that. So I understand the, police, the groups. The police oversight committee is strictly a policy committee. To, uh, Talk, from what I understand, talking that's um, talking about how the police face with um, use of force issues, policy issues. Whereas this justice and safety task force is a broader look at the department and and policing and public safety in general, um, and 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 deals with funding mechanisms, looking at at you know social service needs and. Funding. That's a much broader scope than the police oversight task force. I, I, I understand. We are, that. we are talking about audit tasks that that take on that that can inform that broader scoped committee. I, I don't even want to talk about the police accountability task force. I mean, I, I don't think that that's its own separate citizen thing that is dealing with internal policing and policy issues. We're talking about something that's broader and, and touches on external community issues um, and, and also touches upon on budgeting in, in many ways. That's why we're, we're um, addressing that bullet point um, regarding funding streams. Does that make more sense to you? I don't even want to talk about the task force and oversight. That's, that, that's strictly an internal. Now I, now I am confused. Now I am confused. Blaine, do you want to go through that the difference in those two com committees again? So maybe we can clear up any confusion. Sure, I'm glad to, if you'd like to. Uh, the, the first one, um, as has been said, is, is focused on the police department. Uh, the, the mayor appointed a group of citizens, residents, um, to uh, explore and make a recommendation to the mayor and commission about what a, uh, a, a police oversight and accountability board structure might look like, and that is forthcoming. The other uh, public safety and justice initiative uh, involves uh, the, at least what, what the folks that were suggested in the, the CDO at budget time involved a number of court uh, courts. Uh, other public safety agencies, um, some community entities like EADC, ACDC, and others, uh, as well as some citizens and commissioners to work through some of the bigger bigger issues and initiatives that might kind of fall in the gap between many of these different um, stakeholders. Yeah. And so that that task force, which is beyond just the police department, it is a you know community task force, is going to need information about the structure and the the budgeting funding sources of the police force. And so this committee is proposing to get the auditor direction to interact with that committee, present them with that information, and bring feedback from that committee back to this committee in case we want to broaden the scope of the audit in the future based on that feedback. Does that make sense? Russell, do you have anything to say in all this? I, uh, I just went crazy. I'm, I'm listening, hold on one second. I'm trying to get my video. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard the whole thing. Y'all, and you know, I, I think it boils down to um, you know, we've been debating this point for almost 30 minutes now just to have Auditor Maddox talk to a committee. And so, I, 
you know, I'd like to just move on. I, I don't think it's. Do you want to second Commissioner Thornton's motion then? I, I will second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm opposed. Okay. So we've got three, three so eyes. We've, so we've got the two bullets, and then you added a new bullet for the police. New bullet, a new bullet for the auditor to um, bring feedback from that committee back to the audit committee so we may consider broadening the scope if necessary. Okay. And I just want to say, so it doesn't look like I'm leaving on any certain topic, but um, I have to wrap up at 7 o'clock. Okay. Well, um, we, well, we got that one taken care of. Um, we, we might want to quickly talk about the elections office scope um, because um, we went ahead and gave the auditor direction to begin that background analysis and, and keep an eye on this ongoing election. And additional issues have popped up just in the couple of days since early voting has started. Um, so I don't know if we want to reanalyze the the bullet points for the elections office scope. Um, again, again, I thought our intent was um, not to have the art auditor go and and like send a questionnaire and no. set up meetings. It was to just observe the election in action and then it in January or so, that's when the, the, the administrative piece was going to yeah. happen. That's what I thought was the intent. Yeah, yeah, it was for, not to interfere with the election process that is ongoing. That's what my intent was when we voted before. Yeah, and that, that is the, that is, I mean, this, this won't actually even get voted until election day. So, um, you know, there, there is no direction for her to actually interact and, and send out those kind of questionnaires. But she is staying informed on the process and, um, you know, observing the process um, and all, all the issues that are happening around this election. So, um, but... By the time we vote on this, by the time the whole commission votes on this, that election will be over. So, you know, it, I, I believe it's up to this committee to go ahead and, and lay down the scope for next steps. Um, and we've got these objectives listed here um, on our chart. Determine if the BOE members receive orientation. Determine if it's support. Um, determine advertising, board meetings. Um, I think we need to kind of, <sighs> Stephanie, do you want to, do you want to rattle off the scope? Madam Chair, I have a question. And Wait, hold on a second. Um, okay, go ahead and state your question. Um, my question is, why um, was there any, any specific reason that the mayor sent it back to the committee? Was there something that he, you know, that he thought we needed to relook at? I think, um, the, I think the primary reason the mayor sent this back to committee had to do with the police department and the fact that there is already some ongoing analysis regarding pay structure that we didn't need to have in our scope. I think that is... Is, was the heart of that. Um, but now that, you know, we're not even going to have a vote on this till after the election, um, you know, we might as well lay down the scope for this elections office audit. Uh, can I just, can I just ch chime in? Because I want to just clarify something, because if I'm confused, other people will be confused. The chart that Stephanie just showed, as well as this grayed out one, um, I mean, you know, the, the multi- shaded can we call this can it, it says board of elections and the board of elections is an appointed body and it doesn't really read straightforward to me so if this moves forward i'm i'm, I'm not going to be here for for when you guys vote can we call it like department of elections or can I we can we make sure we don't 
call it board of elections because it's because yeah, of the confusion. I, I was going to point that out too. It should be the elections office. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it that, but um, but I also um, I remember that we voted to not do anything there because of the election. But I do understand to observe an election that's not going to happen. You know, so I get the observation part happening right now. But um, I think that. Um, but anyway, I've got to go, and uh, we have a lot of information as usual, and um, I, I, I need to go though. So okay. if, if that can be changed, and then the other part is this comes forward with an agenda item, I think that it should just be the two that we've talked about. I think it's kind of misleading to show these other things that we haven't vetted out. Yeah, but that, I, that's, I agree. Yeah, we'll just okay. have the two items on there. Okay. That's why I want to narrow this down. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry I can't stay. And I'm not going to take over the meeting, but are you? if we change the, um, the, the, the title to... Uh, uh, um, what did you say? Election, um, election, whatever office. you said, and 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 just do the two items, elections office. If we go along with that, break that down to the two uh, to narrow that scope. Are you okay with that, um, Commissioner Wright? Um, I haven't had time to look at that lengthy scope on it. I guess I'm really just uh, in favor right now of of the observation that needs to happen, but um, but. I'm good with it. I'm not going. You know, I'm, I'll I, I'll learn more as y'all as it goes forward. I'm trying. I mean, I, I mean, sooner or later, sooner or later, we should be getting some unanimous vote. Um, if we're all yeah. on the same, right, right, with narrow vote, right. Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm. I'm here. I'm in favor of it being observation only at this point till we um, okay. nail down more details. That's that would be my okay. preference. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I gotta go. I got thanks. An appointment. Talk soon. Talk soon. Okay. Bye bye. Um. Okay. So we've got a long list of of bullet points that have to do with um the board of elections specifically, but I you know we talked about the. You know, the actual issues being that interface between the Board of Elections and the Elections Office. And I think we can, like, wrap up all these bullet points by simply asking for an audit that um, examines the interface and communication between the Elections Office and the Board of Elections. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And that kind of gives gives the auditor, a, you know, a pretty broad scope to take a deep dive into all the the communication and all the um all the interaction oh, between these two entities you know, um, uh, madam chair um i'm probably i'm probably um i'm probably going to We're going to have to disagree a little bit because we got some things, you know, that is going on. I know we're in a public setting, but we have some other things that are going on that may conflict with what you just said. The interface between the Board of Elections and the Elections Office? Yeah. Well, I think part of the reason... Well, the main reason why we've, um, you know, brought this up is that there have been multiple instances in the past year or two where the um, elections office has not carried out the direction of the Board of Elections in a timely manner. Um, we have it going on right now where we have absentee ballot requests that haven't gone out, even though this body, the, the mayor and commission, you know, voted and gave that direction months ago, and um, I'm agreeing you know. with you. I'm agreeing you. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, remind you that there is some other things that yeah, uh, yeah. That, and I that we that need this, to consider. I don't think this audit would interfere with that. I think that you know, I I think that this audit is is strictly analyzing. The, the body of the board itself and the direction from the board itself 
and the function of the elections office to carry out that direction. Um, and I believe also the function, you know, we need to a ask for some insight into the, um, how that office carries out direction from the state board and the secretary of state's office and how that might conflict with local direction, you know, or what is prioritized over, you know, state or local or state board. Um, and I think that this, this bullet point about effectiveness of the, the elections office efforts to comply with reporting and disclosure is important because there are some things that, you know, come to light long after the fact. So, uh, all right. So my question now becomes if we do, if we, if we agree with what you're suggesting, um, when would that take place? We'll vote on it, what, in November, right? We'll vote on it on election day. To, for the full board? Mm -hmm. All right, for the full right. board, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and that'll, that'll get... And, um, and, and... I tell you what, I will, um, I will go along with this because I'm going to have to get ready to go also. But um, if other things are still, I, I will, um, um, I want people to know if other things are still going on, I will be voting no in November. Okay. So I, I'll move it to um, the full commission. But if things, um, if other things are, you know, circulating around and, and, and some other things come up, I will be voting no in November. Um, so I, I just want to suggest that we just, you know, these first one, two, three, four, five bullet points that talk about the interface with the, the Board of Elections issues, um, that, that we just combine that into one bullet point that is... Um, examine the interface and communication and between the board of election and the elections office. Got it. Um, and then that bullet point about assessing the effectiveness. Um, I don't think that should say BOE. I think it should say elections office. I think that's where some of the confusion lies here. Um, okay. And um, I mean, I'd, I'd suggest we also um, add to that bullet point um, or, or add a bullet point, um, assess these elections office um, interface with the state board and state secretary of state's office because it, it appears that we're getting conflicting direction between our local board of election the state board of election and the secretary of state's office sometimes and we need to make sense of you know like right now we have these absentee ballot requests that are late and apparent we're not sure if it's our local elections office is responsible or the state Secretary of State's office is responsible. We need to clear these kinds of things up. I don't know if if that's a um, I don't know if that's a good justification for me personally. But like I said, I will be willing to, if if Russell makes the motion, I will second it. And uh, but so if move. things are still confusing, I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Stephanie, do you want to send me that text and, and I'll make sure that we captured everything? I can I send will. it out to the whole committee too, just to make sure we captured everything. Okay. I will. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Is there any other old business anybody wants to bring up? Nope. Does no, ma'am. Does anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
It's good, good night, night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Night. Take care. Bye-bye.